Welcome to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish. On this show, we go beyond the everyday forecasts to give you the how and why on all the cool and interesting things that you may be wondering about and uh, may have wanted to ask about in the fields of weather, space, and science. And in this episode, we're going to be exploring another way in which AccuWeather provides superior accuracy deep into the future. While the short-term forecast is often the utmost importance, people, business, farmers, and also a whole variety of people benefit from knowing the weather trends coming into the next few months. We're talking about AccuWeather's long-range team, and they're ready to deliver this crucial information. So joining us now to discuss this is lead U.S. AccuWeather long-range forecaster, Paul Pasolak. Paul, great to be with you once again. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Well, I always I love, love uh, talking to you because you do some fascinating things, and uh, for a lot of us who spend our time in the, the next three to seven days in the forecast world, uh, there's a lot of questions about long-range forecasting. Well, hey, don't, hey, you do help out once in a while with the wildfire forecast. I do grab you and pull you out of the short range and get you into the long range at times. Remember that. Uh, so. I know. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, a little bit of a, a knack for fire weather, the volunteer fire service. But yes. you've been with AccuWeather for over three decades, yes. and you become our lead U.S. long-range forecaster about 10 years ago. So how did that happen, and how did you get interested in, in weather just kind of uh, at ground zero? Well, to be honest with you, it wasn't really my choice. It was funny. Uh, I was asked, uh, you know, when you, when you start a job, you start down low and you have a lot of seniority people ahead of you and they have their permanent positions, their set times and ways. I was kind of more of a filler. I, I kind of came in when everyone, someone was off, I'd filled in for their schedule. And then one day I got asked to kind of, eh, why don't you be, include into the long range department? We have this one guy that needs a little help. And I said, sure, for about six months I did that. And then he ended up leaving. And then all of a sudden I'm sitting in my office and they come down and they say, you're in charge. And so I just had to pick it up from there. And, uh, and it was fast paced from there because I had to research a lot more. I had to look into getting a team built. And so it was basically by accident that it just fell in my lap. And we want to talk more about long range forecasting. It's just a fascinating thing. Um, and I know that it can be leveraged by big businesses to improve their bottom line, but fundamentally, how do you produce a long-range yeah. forecast? I know there's no real easy, straightforward answer to this. I take, I took an approach. I thought about this for many, for a long time, um, and and what I felt I had to teach myself. Okay, that's something I didn't really quite learn in school. I learned the physics of weather, but long-range and the approach came from me and my team around me that I did develop, but. A lot of the research is done before you do the actual forecast. I mean, you got to look at past data, the climatology, all those kind of things. And it takes time before you actually start indulging into the forecast. And then I would look at past years and I developed this, what we call an analog chart. And it looked at past years and some of the, what we call teleconnections and, and, and sea surface temperature anomalies and El Nino, La Nino, things like that. We would put in this chart and try to match up to what happened in the past to what's happening now. And this chart took me a while. You weigh things and then all of a sudden you get higher years that stick out and it kind of paints a picture of what you expect coming forward. Then I take that and then I match it up with forecast models. And so when you put that approach to it, you're getting a lot more involved in it and just looking at a few models that are not always that accurate when you look out three, four, five months out ahead. So that's the kind of approach our team does. And then of course, Everyone's, we have a meeting just before the seasonal forecast gets put out. We get together for about two hours. Maybe I bring donuts or something like that for the meeting. And then we put it together, and that's how we come with our forecast. And a lot of the uh, things that you're looking at on the baseline tend to be things in the atmosphere that don't change day to day, like ocean water temperatures, as you were saying. Yes. Things that, uh, if they are such a way now, they're likely to be on a similar state maybe five, seven, ten days down the road. Yeah, exactly. And so those are tough things that you have to adjust and adapt to. Um, it, it, they, they, could, they could change within a couple of weeks and throw off a forecast because you talk about what we call marine heat waves, okay, and they're becoming more and more popular uh, to the public now. And they can change positioning of where high pressure areas are and low pressure areas are. And so this is something we look at that maybe the forecast models don't pick up right away. And so these are the kind of things that help with our long range forecasting is picking up those little things that turn out to be big things in the results 
because of warm water temperatures that marine heat waves put out. So. And uh, there's a lot of conversation about heat and, and uh, changes in climate. Yes. When it comes to analogs, mm -hmm. you know, uh, weather patterns that resemble times in the past that could be kind of tipping the hat to, tipping the scales as to, as to the long range forecast, is it becoming increasingly dif difficult mm -hmm. to, to rely on analogs or, or not so much? It's changing because our climate's changing and things like uh, the water temperatures are warming more in the mid latitudes. Uh, the polar regions are changing. Uh, different from what they were 15, 20, 30 years ago. So what we learn in our research from these papers, okay, from the past, may not be the, quite the result in the present time. And that's why with long-range forecasting, it's not so much operational. It's looking and indulging into these papers, the updated ones, especially from new, new people that show these changes that are going on. And we have to adapt as well. What we may have saw 20 years ago from one teleconnection or something uh, could be different from what's going to happen nowadays. And so it's, it's challenging to adjust and, and make those uh, changes because it could change your entire forecast. When I started studying meteorology at Penn State, uh, John Porter was in my class. Okay. He was one of two in my class. We graduated with 34 students. Uh, and he was one of two who had ever seen a computer model before day one mm -hmm. of college. Now, I just interact with enough students uh, on Twitter or X that it's clear that almost anybody interested in meteorology now is already looking at the models as oh, yeah. they're coming into college. It's so accessible now compared to 25 years ago. Uh, so if you're a, a future forecaster, you want to do meteorology and you want to do long-range meteorology, mm -hmm. uh, what would you give as advice for a future long-range forecaster to work on their skills at this point? I'm a pattern recognizer. I, I like to look at patterns and kind of try to see what that looks like from year to year or from past years. There are so many forecast models compared to when I first came into the business. So there are many out there that will strictly go with the models. I see it on Twitter. I see it on other things that say, hey, this is showing this. But you still have to look at the physics and research involved with these every pattern from season to season, month to month, whatever. And I say, make sure you do the work, do the research, look at this stuff ahead of time. Know the, the, all the teleconnections, know how the water temperatures react from different seasons, okay? You gotta have all that in your, in your library. Uh, it's not just looking at the forecast models. I know they can do much more than they did in the past, but they can be off. And you're talking about a forecast that can get derailed very easily mm. uh, in the first month, and it could affect the following month. So you need to, I always like to look at what can go wrong in this forecast better than what's right with this forecast. And I think taking that approach sometimes is a, a, another advice to people out there doing long-range forecasting. And we use the consensus-based approach to forecasting Absolutely. here at AccuWeather. So uh, it's not just one person's opinion. You lead the team, but you also uh, bounce things off of your team members. I have members that are experts in wildfire, severe weather, drought, and having another pair of eyes and then bringing all that knowledge into the forecast is great. And sometimes I can't remember it all in my head, so I have a series of notebooks. In fact, I have about 10 of them still where I write in for different types of things, and it keeps me organized. And if I forget something, I can look back. That's great. You know, something from three, four years ago. So yeah. I still do it kind of the old-fashioned way, but it helps. It keeps me organized. And that's another thing. Stay organized when you're doing these long-range forecasts. Once you start getting on... It'll throw you off. Okay. So, good advice. But yeah. well, we do have a viewer question here, and uh, we okay. want to get to this question from Chris in Minnesota, who writes, "What goes into generating a 45-day or a 90-day forecast?" And these exist on mm -hmm. AccuWeather.com and AccuWeather Pro site, and, and so forth. Absolutely, we do a 90-day forecast. Uh, you know, every quarterly, and uh, what we do is again the same approach. We start looking at past years that match up to what's going on or what has happened in the past. We put all that information, you know, is it a La Nina year, is it an El Nino year, is it going to be this, this, the water temperatures globally too. We look on the other side of the globe. We put it all together and then we come up with the modeling side by side. I put it all in a PowerPoint, present it to my team, and then we sit there and we, you know, adjust it and make changes and come up with a consensus forecast that we can present out, and that's how we generally do our approach. Okay, we use uh, Slack to do a lot of our internal communication here Absolutely. at Active Weather, and I, I lurk on the, the long-range channel sometimes, <laughs> and there's a lot, a lot that goes on there. I learn a lot just by 
where you're reading your stuff. And I do it out, I throw that out there so I can get comments, you know, push some of my team to say, hey, is this looking right to you? Because this is what it looks like to me, and I get responses, and I think that's how you get the best forecast out of everybody. Okay, very good. Yeah. Well, coming up next, Paul and I are going to discuss uh, some different seasonal long-range forecasts that uh, he and his team provide here at AccuWeather. And we're going to talk about differences in forecasting for each when we look that far into the future. And coming up later, we're going to take you back in time with the incredible story behind what's been called the most important weather forecast in history. Stay with us. We have plenty more coming your way. Welcome back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish, and we are talking about AccuWeather's long-range forecasting team, and our expert today is AccuWeather Senior Meteorologist and Lead U.S. AccuWeather Long-Range Forecaster, Paul Pastelock. And Paul, again, we appreciate your insight. I'm glad you're making time for us. We do have some more questions for you today. All right, sounds good. All Far right. away. All right, well, we do long-range forecasts for different seasons. We have spring, summer, fall, mm -hmm. and winter. So which season even hurricane season, another big one that uh, is very mm -hmm. important. Uh, but uh, obviously, which season uh, is the most challenging? Some are easier than others, I'm sure. Spring. I have to say, I say that all the time when I get asked that because there is so much that we put into our spring forecast. It's not just about temperatures. It's not about precip as much. It's what it's, people ask me, is it, is it going to be a really rough, severe weather season? Is it going to be... Is it going to be tough as far as drought or flooding? Which one? Those specifics is what we put into our spring forecast. You can see some of the graphics on the screen. We pride ourselves in hitting, uh, you know, kind of more of the more interesting, the more specific things. And we put it out there for our three-month forecast. Not many other outlets do that. Okay, so they, they, they kind of break it up a little bit and put special forecasts from here to here. But we put it all together into one forecast and an and example one of them the late frost forecast I mean we do a lot of research into you know what's the normal frost time period what uh, you know when we think it's going to be you know uh, faster for some places and later for others so that is something that we pride ourselves in and, and, and it takes a lot of uh, time to put these specific and there's a lot of it in the springtime and I know that uh, when it comes to winter time there's always a big appetite for that snowfall yes. forecast especially in the Northeast um, a lot of uh, other forecast operations, they put some generic words on a map. Mm -hmm. You put actual numbers and forecast ranges for some specific cities. And we put it out, we start a preview one like in late August, early September, and then we update throughout the season. And of course, everyone wants to know when the last snow is going to be, and so that carries over into the spring season. So we do a lot of that stuff as well in spring. And once we put out a seasonal forecast ahead of time, does it just sit on the shelf, or do you continually update that at certain benchmarks as we move toward that season? Uh, we'll put out a three or four times the snow forecast, whether it's you know changing or not. You know, a little adjustment here and there because you know you know things can change very drastically depending on you know who gets the snow and who doesn't. Storm tracks as well. So we will update what we need to update, um, uh, make the adjustments, and. Uh, you know, go from there. So we don't let it sit on the shelf at all. And before the break, we kind of hinted at this, and I think this is one of the most fascinating things at AccuWeather. Uh, who are the recipients of some of this information? Yes. There are some big businesses that can leverage this intel in some really unique ways. Some of our bigger clients are insurance companies. Uh, they need to know where they need to properly put people if there's going to be a, a severe weather break or a frequency of severe weather in a certain area of the country. So they'll make sure they'll highlight that area. Another thing, too, is uh, retail. Um, a lot of your big stores and chains, they want to know ahead of time where they have to move their product, have it in distri distribution centers, and not to overload or, or not have enough. You know, you need to have that, know that supply. And weather does affect how these businesses adjust. And so we have some of those bigger clients asking us all the time, not just one season, sometimes two seasons ahead. So, I believe that. That's yeah. interesting. And some of these clients are huge. So if we can help their bottom line, they do Absolutely. something on a huge scale by even 1%. That's a big difference. And even the emergency um, management uh, teams in certain cities uh, look to us ahead of time. I've done some presentations in the past to let them know this is how far out we can. They always ask that question, how far out can you predict this? Yeah. How far? And we let them know that. We let them know this is where we're at right now. 
we can give you some, you know, preview stuff and then update as we go along. And that helps them very much in preparing in case of a tropical system or severe weather outbreaks. They probably appreciate the, uh, the confidence level and the transparency that you Absolutely. sometimes express as well. Well, it is time to answer some more viewer <laughs> questions. We want to hear from Greg in Atlanta. Uh, and uh, Greg, what do you want to ask the expert? Yeah, how accurate are long range forecasts? <laughs> How accurate our forecast depends on what you're you're talking about. Are you talking about temperatures? Are you talking? There's everything has got a different way of measuring as far as accuracy goes, and we we feel that we are pretty darn good. We're up there as far as getting things done. We have looked back in the past and compared our numbers, and uh, uh, we're we're pretty steady, especially especially with temperatures, severe weather trends is really one of our highlights. We, you know, forecasting the number of tornadoes can be difficult, but forecasting the trends, the areas of the country, we do very good at that. And also getting people out on tropical, tropical season of forecasts, another area that we're very accurate as well on ahead of time. So um, I, I think we do pretty well and we really take our chances and push the limit on some of these other detailed type of things like drought and flooding and those things. And if we always stayed back uh, where the historical comfort level was, then we'd never move the ball downfield in terms of advancing the science and, and improving uh, the forecast. Absolutely. Abilities. People would just yeah. go with, you know, climatology all the time. And uh, that's not where we're at at this no. point, right? Not 1950 anymore. <laughs> nope. Well, our next question comes from Taylor in New Jersey, and Taylor writes, do you consult the old farmer's almanac? Sometimes even, uh, you know, I'll get questions like these just as, uh, as a meteorologist. Uh, Taylor, it's in my, my backpack all the time. It's always there. I always have one. <laughs> it never goes without me. I mean, there's some really good, interesting stuff in there. You the know? sun and moon, uh, right? Absolutely. I, I can't stuff. remember all that stuff. <laughs> right. um, How about but, the forecast intel, though? But the forecast, the, the pretty pictures, I, I get it. Um, it's entertaining. It looks nice. Um, you know, I do look at it. I do. I look at everything. You know, I mean, I see what other people are doing. Or, you know, where are they from my forecast? You know, I don't copy their forecast. I, I look at to see maybe they're seeing something that I don't see at this point, and then I indulge in looking in that area and say, hey, wait a minute, maybe this is you know on the right track. Make some adjustments here. I will do that from time to time. But to be honest. But most of the time, I just do it just to see, you know, the comparison to ours. <laughs> All right. It's good to be aware of what other people are talking about yeah. uh, in general, even just in, in the public. Absolutely. Well, that'll wrap, wrap up our question and answer segment. We do want to thank AccuWeather's lead long-range forecaster, Paul Pastelock, for joining us on this edition of Ask the Experts. After the break, we're going to have the incredible story behind the weather forecast that changed history. Welcome back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. It is time for WeatherWise, and in this episode, we talk about what's been called the most important weather forecast in history. World War II, 1944. American, British, and Canadian troops are preparing to invade the coast of Normandy, and weather played an enormous role in what we now know as D-Day. So before radar, computers, and satellites, weather prediction was based on past records or surface observations, meaning predicting more than a day or two in advance was nearly impossible. Plans for the D-Day invasion required a triple assault, and the weather was crucial for each part of the mission. Pilots needed clear skies and a full moon for visibility. Naval operations needed calm seas with low winds to get troops ashore, and then ground troops needed a low tide to see German obstacles waiting them on the beach. The original plan was to storm the beaches on June 5th, but General Eisenhower's chief meteorologist, Group Captain James Martin Stagg, made a pivotal forecast. He advised waiting one day until June 6th. Going in as planned, June 5th, with potentially rough and stormy seas in the English Channel, would have jeopardized the operation. Waiting an extra day could allow Germans to see the invasion fleet assembling off the southern English coast, though. So with favorable weather on June 6th, the successful Normandy invasion took the Germans by surprise, and it was the beginning of the path to victory in Europe and eventually the end of World War II. Thanks so much for joining us, and remember, when you have a question, you can email us at asktheexperts at accuweather.com. You can also call us at 888-566-6606. Thanks for joining us. Have a great one.